Really? Mm-hmm. Shake it. Yeah. What's up? It is Wednesday. Time for Matt Therapy. I am your host, Donna Gonzalez. Welcome to my <laughs> left. I got Miss Bex and Violence, Becky Dominguez, the co-hostess with the mostest. What up, everyone? Super producer, Lee Syatt. Say hi, Lee. Hello, everybody. And our guest today is veteran MMA journalist. Is, is that a good title? I think that's fair. Awesome veteran <laughs> MMA journalist who has a really cool book coming out calling, called Ali vs. Inoki, The Forgotten Fight That Inspired Mixed Martial Arts and Launched Sports Entertainment. Josh Gross, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So this is awesome, but I, I want to talk about the book, but I want to talk about you first because you're super interesting and you've been around the MMA scene forever, right? 16 years as a reporter. That's, yeah, a, that's yeah, a long time. Before then, uh, as a fan, I was going to fights all over Southern California, you know, starting mm-hmm. like 97, 98, stuff like that. So, yeah, I've been around the game for a little bit. So what made you start writing about it? Are you a journalist by trade? That's Yeah, I, was, uh, I became one. I mean, I, I certainly was interested in that, and I was in school at the time. And, um, you know, I kind of combined my passion for the sport and mixed martial arts. And what I realized was something I wanted to do was journalism. And it, they really went well together at the time, yeah. And I bet there wasn't a lot of, were you just like, I'm going to be an MMA journalist? Because there's journalists out there that, you know, focus on football and focus on basketball. And there's then some talk about all of them. So were you like, I'm going to talk about all sports or I'm just going to focus on this? I was always interested in sports. I mean, I was a I was a pretty terrible student, quite honestly. Like my education was going into my high school classes, reading the newspaper and opening the sports page and paying no attention to my teachers. Right. So um, I, at a certain point when I realized that journalism was, was sort of a, something that I've always been inclined to do and wanted to do. Um, and I wandered into this space that was kind of like the Wild West. It was really captivating to be able to re- be around these people and in this environment and this underground world in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, I just was, you know, motivated to stay there and I wanted to write about it. And I didn't have any great ambitions to become, you know, some reporter. I couldn't have envisioned any day working for Sports Illustrated or ESPN. Like that was a reality that was possibly going to happen in this crazy cage right. fighting stuff. Um, I just enjoyed being around uh, the sport, doing journalism. There wasn't a lot of that. Um, starting to ask some tougher questions of people that they probably weren't used to and mm-hmm. uh, reporting on stories that hadn't been done. And that was, uh, that was fun stuff. And uh, here we are 16 years later. That's awesome. Were so, you, what was were you training in any of it, or were you just you just liked watching it? No, I trained. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah, I did. I did jujitsu for about four years. I did Krav Maga for about four years. I was around fighters. I trained with Boss Rudin and Oleg Taktarov and oh. a whole bunch of people. So, That's, you know, yeah. really, yeah. Have, do you still train? I haven't trained in a while. Uh, I got injured. I got my knee ripped up on a on a heel ah, hook. Yeah. <laughs> and at a certain yeah. point, I just thought I'll be just a lazy reporter. I'm good with that. But I, I got enough bad experience to really feel like I knew what it was like that these what the fighters did, yeah. what their training was. I was around enough fighters to understand some of their mentality. And I think there's no question about that that experience and, and those moments on the mat helped me understand what was happening in the cage and helped my journalism in mixed martial arts. For sure. Yeah. Awesome. What was the first fight that you covered? Do you remember? The first fight that I covered as a reporter uh, was an IFC event. IFC was a a pretty well-known promotion. They've done a lot of shows around the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, They used to hold shows up near Fresno in a place called Fryant, California. Okay. And it was an Indian reservation, like uh, most of the fights in California were at the time. Um, uh, it was it was quite a night, actually. I think it was IFC Warriors Challenge 4 or 5, whatever it was. I'd go to a lot of the King of the Cages in Southern California, Taboba. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, Southern California really was, for me, I think one of the reasons why I was so attracted to it, that this was the hotbed. I mean, Yeah, you had so much readily this, available this, this to is, you. This yeah. is where it was happening in a lot of ways. A lot of fighters were coming out of Southern California. Tito Ortiz was huge at the time, and he was coming from here, obviously. Huntington Beach and Tank Abbott and all those mm-hmm. people. So um, it was a perfect storm for me as someone who's interested in the sport. As soon as I started becoming a, uh, a focused on journalism, I kind of let my fandom disappear. And I think a lot of people don't do that. I'm not a fan anymore of the sport. I mean, I love it. and I yeah. love covering it. I love being around it. But I can't let myself be a fan. I can't root for fighters. I can't have emotions get in the way of how well, I see things. You'd become a little more biased. Your yeah. yeah look, and, and there is, I mean, this is a natural bias that people have, sure. right? Um, but I knew that if I was going to be a professional at this sort of thing, that I couldn't let those things get in the way. So, right. so um, how do you watch fights? Do you just appreciate it for a really cool display of athleticism or are you analyzing the fight the whole time or all all that i mean i I certainly appreciate what the fighters bring into the cage and the skills involved i mean i'm well aware you know having been around fighters and having trained and having seen the sport for so long um 
Yeah, I don't. I don't watch with a rooting interest. I never gamble on the fights. Um, I don't. You know, I have. I hold myself to certain standards that I just won't do. And um, yeah, it's it's fun. I mean, I, I love writing on fight night. I love writing a deadline report, like turning in, you know, a twelve hundred word story an hour after the fights and having people read it and that kind of stuff. Really, yeah, awesome. yeah, enjoy that. What's the most memorable fight that you've covered? Is there any any that stands out? I mean, there's so many that stand out. It's so it's so difficult. I mean, for me, I went to 12 Pride events, so I covered oh. Pride 12 oh, times cool. in person in Japan. Wow! Uh, I covered basically all the Zufa UFCs from 2001 till the end of 2005. And I don't know if you know this about me, but I don't I don't have access to the UFC. I, I did, yeah. and I, yeah. Why is that? Well, I mean, I, that's their decision as a promoter. I don't think they were liking the journalism that I did. Um, they tried to hire me at one point. I, I said, I'm not interested in working for you. I want to do journalism. I can't do journalism for you. You're a promoter. They're not the only promoter that tried to hire me along the way. I've had a bunch of them try to hire really? me. Really? Yeah, and I'm not interested in that kind of stuff, and I never was. So, What would a journalist do for a promotion, like spin their stories the way that they want it spun? I don't know. I didn't care. I wasn't interested. I knew that by taking their money and, and participating you, that way, I couldn't I couldn't be a journalist. I couldn't you couldn't be unbiased. Yeah. Wait, they have the, it's like the paid content. Content like CNN. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah you know, it's um, UFC wanted to hire me to build UFC.com and run the editorial there. Literally, this was the, what they wanted me to do. Uh, I was flattered by the offer. I was, you know, editing SureDog.com at the time. I was making a thousand bucks a month. They uh, they offered me forty thousand a year, and I was like, I'm not interested in working for Dana White or the UFC. And I told him that, and um, you know. They, he, he said it would be They're a mistake. like, you can't come to our fights anymore. Well, he said it would be a mistake and uh, that I would regret it. And um, they tried to hire me again along the way. And I, again, I wasn't interested. But, um, you know, there's a whole history there. I, I think the stories that I cover and the way that I cover the sport um, was something that um, I think they weren't very interested in. And I, was, I edited a lot of magazine. I edited Fight Sport magazine, which was put out by Black Belt in around 2002. And even then they were getting me about, like, how do you put this guy in the cover? He's not our guy. And, you know, just a lot of politics. Um, so I wasn't interested in playing their games. That's really cool. Mm. Yeah. Um, so what you you were at Sure Dog and mm -hmm. you've been at Sports Illustrated. Yeah, I was at, I was at Sure Dog and from well, I guess like 2004 to 2008, I was executive editor. I ran. That's uh, right in the height of when UFC yeah, was coming into yeah, the public yeah, view, sure. and Sure Dog was Sure Dog was huge. The, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then I left Sure Dog in 2008 uh, to go to Sports Illustrated. Um, and I was there for two years and got a, a, an offer from ESPN when they were jumped on board the sport. Um, when I was at SureDog, actually ESPN, that's when they became interested in MMA. They partnered with SureDog. You know, we developed that relationship, and uh, you know, it was good for them. You know, they're still on board in the sport, and it's amazing to me when I see guys on Sports Center and all sorts of stuff how far they've come in terms of their interest in mixed martial arts. So, yeah, uh, I, I worked uh, with ESPN from 2011 through 2013 for three years. And uh, end of 2013, they didn't renew my deal, and I kind of went off into the wilderness and did my own thing. And right now, I'm working for the Guardian, the Guardian newspaper, covering fights, um, uh, working for other people here and there. I had a big piece on Deadspin last year that was kind of indicative of the kind of journalism that I do about Vitor Belfort and the UFC. And, mm -hmm. and I, I, people weren't very happy about that one. Well, what, I mean, I don't know which people. Yeah. Some people were happy about it. A lot of people were interested <laughs> yeah. in that story. Um, you know, but that you know that was a hard story, and that was something that. Um, um, I'm I was proud of that was an important story to come out so that's awesome how um, I just lost my train of thought I had a question oh what what's your opinion on the sale of the UFC how do you think that's going to affect yeah. the sport the promotion the, that we know it's, it's a hard to say too many like to be determines on that the deal looks real a lot of like serious reporting around it I mean the sale of the UFC is something that they've explored for many years mm -hmm. I know that I've I've definitely heard insights into you know them putting feelers out and getting offers and but this is this is real now um, I'm fairly certain that Lorenzo Fertitta has been angling to get out of the UFC for a year he wants to go back to his casino business what it means and he says I, he wants to buy a football well team, the, right? I, he hasn't said that directly but people have oh. people have said that um, you know and you know there's talk about the Raiders perhaps going to Las Vegas and him having a piece of that um, there's also an NHL team possibly going to Vegas so I think there's a lot I think mostly it's about his casino business primarily is what I think the move to go back plus I mean, you turn around a two million investment into four point two billion dollars. Yeah, not bad. That's yeah. pretty good, right? Like, yeah. What is that? What do you think that says about the sport? Because I've only been a fan for a few years. You've yeah. been a fan for or working in it for over. You know a decade. things that most people don't know about the sport. Like um, even yeah. those of us consider ourselves fight nerds. 
you're privy to so much more information. So your perspective has to be a lot different. Yeah, well, my perspective is different for a lot of reasons. I was very close to what the UFC was doing. Then I watched it from a distance, so I have a different view that way. Obviously, I've known a lot of people in the business for a long time. I have a lot mm -hmm. of sources, and you hear stuff. There's been a lot of stuff over the years that I've heard that I couldn't report just because I couldn't verify it or sure. get people on the record that way. But the sport has come so far. Uh, it really has. And it's amazing to me, you know, like I said earlier, it's sort of this idea that you still see this stuff on Sports Center once in a while sort of blows my mind. So the fact that you have a potential conglomerate, you know, with the owner of the New England Patriots and these giant Chinese media companies. Is that what the conglomerate is made up? Because I couldn't that's find what the, that's any what the like reports, details. That's what the reports are, yeah. So like the craft group. Yeah. And so and then WME is still an agency out here. Wow, and really? Well, the William Morris agency is going to be a partial owner of well, the UFC? Well, they, they, the partial owner, they facilitated the deal. So they've been representing the UFC and Dana White for years. Okay. And, um, that makes sense. you know, so, yeah, it kind of adds up. Um, there, there was two competing bids. There was another bid on another side, Chinese media company as well. Whatever it happens, it says to me that um, people of big banks and big vision understand that this sport and what mixed martial arts is and what the UFC is uh, can go global. It is going global. The fact that you have these Chinese companies so interested says that the China market is is ripe for this. You know, mm -hmm. the UFC hasn't really been in China. They've gone to Macau, which is not China. Once you get into mainland China, it's a whole different deal. I'm excited to see what that means in terms of the proliferation, what kind of fighters are going to come out of China now. So there's a lot of things to be determined. We, I mean, it's unclear whether Dana White will remain or, or you know, go. Yeah. Um, but... You know, uh, this was an incredible era for what they created, what they built, and for them to um, have the vision and the guts to do it, and then to say, "This is our time to get out." I mean, they—that's huge. Yeah, they, they know what they're doing. And it's I, business. I, I, I assume but that they're going to leave it in the hands of people who are good stewards of mm -hmm. the sport. They're not going to give it away to people. They built up something pretty incredible beyond just the fight business. They're a media company now, right? And that's where most of their—I I think most of the potential in terms of their business is. So, um, yeah, I, look, I think. The sport will always persist because mixed martial arts is something that people love watching and they've been exposed to in ways now that, um, uh, you know, that they weren't 20 years ago. Well, completely. Yeah. And, um, you know, it doesn't matter the most casual people, you know. Oh, yeah. Everybody knows. Everybody knows. Everybody knows, everybody knows oh, yeah. something UFC, about it yeah. now. So, like, I mean, everybody can name mothers, a fighter now. Yeah. 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 That's where it's gone. So two part question or maybe two different questions. Mm. Um, I want to know what do you think that the UFC is going, especially with all of this, in the direction of the NFL, where they're going to it's going to become a league and the only reference that we have for MMA. Like, do you see them taking over everything? Well, right now they have the best of all worlds, right? So they sort of operate like a league, but when it doesn't suit them, they're not a league; they're a promotion. So, mm -hmm. and that like I think there's a lot of things. So we don't know exactly what the dynamics of the sale are. We don't know what this legislation in Washington D.C. is going to do. The Muhammad Ali Expansion Act, right. you know, that could totally change the structure of mixed martial arts and completely alter how their business runs. We don't know if the fighters are finally going to come together for a union or association. That's my second question. There's, there's a lot of yeah. things. This is a really turbulent and interesting time in the sport. And for guys like me who've been around it forever, it feels like oh, you know, th this thing's been happening. But it's only been an unfolding in a real way for just over twenty years. Mm -hmm. And even though we're living in a day and age where things happen so quickly, and we want instant gratification, and it feels like the sports progress so far so fast. I mean, it's still we're this, you know we're basically like talking about an adolescent sport. There's right. a lot of room to in shift. The grand and, scheme, yeah. Right, a lot of room to shift, and 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 I think we're right now in a pretty important period. Okay. Um, that my second question was the Ali Act. What do you? What's your opinion on fighter pay and having a union for the fighters? And also, what's your relationship with fighters like? Um, my relationship with fighters is professional relationship. I don't consider any fighter a friend. None. No. Oh wow. Um, I don't. I don't let myself become friends with them or too That's close smart. to them. Um, you know, I certainly am respectful of what they do. Some fighters like me. Some fighters don't. Um, the ones that don't know where I'm coming from all the time, so that's fine by me. Um, you know, as as far as you know, the changing business landscape, the union, and all these sorts of things, really, really hard to say. Um, right now, fighters are contractors, but you know they don't have the rights and the freedoms of contractors, and in some right. ways, they're restricted like by employee sort of status. They're in a really weird spot, and so I'd like to see some clear definitions on what fighters are, what their fighters are, relationships to the promoters, um, and that's what I think this Ali Expansion Act seeks to do. Um, it's pretty pretty broad 
piece of legislation. Again, and the thing about MMA in terms of how it's been regulated, it's always been taken from, well, this is what we did with boxing. Let's just apply it to mixed martial arts. And they did that with the 10-point must scoring system. Right. They did that with a lot of the rules and the way the sport's regulated and how the commissions handle. So again, we're seeing a situation where we had this law that was designed to protect boxers and, the, and, and influence the boxing industry sort of applying not just to MMA, but all of combat sports. But do you think that the same things can apply? Do you think it essentially because as a sport it's the same thing? Or do you think new rules need to be made for MMA because of the, I don't know, the nature of the I sport? Th- I think the bottom line, and this is what the, the congressman, he's a congressman from Oklahoma, this is what he wants, basically. He said, all right, either become a league and treat your fighters like employees, right. like other leagues do, right. or allow these guys to operate like the ind- independent contractors that you have them under you know, deals right now. So that's, it's one or the other. And I think he's really trying to force their hand, force their position on it. Well, um, it would seem fair. If you're an best, independent contractor, sure. you should be able to fight for whoever is offering you the most money right. at you the moment. You shouldn't yeah. get locked into long-term deals. You should Unless have say over what sponsors you yeah. want to wear. You should have a lot of more control over your career. You look at individual sports like golf and tennis, and these you know athletes have much more say over what they do. Um, you know, when you work in a league and you have collective bargaining and it's a whole different operation, you know, then there's protections that come there too. So the UFC has the best of all worlds right now, and the fighters are kind of pigeonholed into a really rough they spot. They can play whatever card yeah. they want, uh, depending yeah. on the situation. Well, look at their response to this Ali Act, right? So the the one of the things that they would do was institute, like, rankings and create sanctioning bodies. And you can criticize that and say that that's not where the sport should go. Boxing has suffered under sanctioning bodies, and you don't see the best fights. Um, but at the same point, you know, you can make the argument, well, um, the UFC says, well, our titles and our championship belts aren't really championship belts. They're things They're that, we, for us, yeah. th- that we award them, uh, you know, each time. And th- so it's like the UFC is sort of just, you know, six of one, half dozen of another, and they play whichever one is the best one for them. And they've been smart that way. They created this space. They created, you know, mixed martial arts. And one of the things I really get into in the book uh, and then I have a much better understanding now after writing this book is that mixed martial arts as a sport is designed as a hybrid, a hybrid of pro wrestling and a hybrid of sport. And so whichever one suits them at that particular time, that's how they play it. Wait, that's interesting. You're the first person, maybe not the first person that's ever had said it, but the first person I've heard say that, hmm. that it's a hybrid. I, I guess that makes sense. But the business, let- the business model is pro wrestling. The business model, really? yeah, and it has been for a long time. Zufa, one of the first things they did when they when they bought the company was bring in WWE folks to advise. I them. didn't know that. Yeah. Okay, so that's how your your book came about. You're writing about um, MMA, the sport, and covering all the fights. But then, tell tell us how this book came about. And um, well, the idea, the original genesis for the was I went to Japan. I was covering these fights, uh, these Pride fights, and I I never really bought souvenirs back. I'm not a big tchotchke guy i don't like i'm not sentimental that kind of way well it sounds like this is just your job you're like i'm here to write them well no but i I love i love the journalism i love being around it believe me if i didn't enjoy what i do i wouldn't do it i've engineered my entire life to do something that i want to do i don't have a commute i don't have a nine to five job like these are things that i've done on purpose because i knew that i would not be happy the other way and fortunately i've been able to pull it off for the most part on one of my Japan trips, it was one of the later ones, they had a show at the Tokyo Dome. And so I was walking around the Tokyo Dome. I went into this shop, like this fight and pro wrestling memorabilia shop, just to check it out, just to see what they had. Sure. And uh, there was a, a poster on the wall of this Ali Inoki match. And it was actually a replica poster from one of the closed circuit events in Riverside, California. So I'm an L.A. guy born and raised. I was like, wow, sort of a California tie in here. What's this? Yeah, yeah. What's this Ali Inoki thing? I kind of knew, but I didn't really know. Uh, and it was the only thing I ever brought back from Japan. It's hanging in my office. Really? And I told myself that one day, you know, I would do something about that story, whether it was write a book or do a documentary. But I was, I felt in my in my mind, in my heart, that I would write a book about it one day. And you know, I finally had the time and the inclination and the guts to do it because I was always scared to write a book. Quite honestly, it's it's a real daunting kind of mission. You know, yeah. it's a big project. So um, I was glad that I just dove in head first and had a great time with it. So the Ali, it's it's um, Muhammad Ali versus Antonio Inoki, who was right. a huge wrestling star. Yeah, and that's even pro wrestling, pro wrestling right. though. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, pro wrestling, but the, the, even that's Dave Meltzer. Do you know who Dave Meltzer is? Yeah. A boxing, well, not a boxing, but a pro wrestling and MMA reporter. He's been around forever. Okay. one of the most well known um, pro wrestling reporters. Um, he is actually one of the characters in my book. Something I do is I talk to three media guys who were old enough to have seen the closed circuit live and were there and watched the closed circuit live. Wow. And so, so Dave watched it in San Jose and he was 17. Um, and I mentioned him because he, he gave me so much history and, and backstory on this. And essentially the way that he framed Antonio Noki was 
a combination of Hulk Hogan, Stone Cold Steve Austin, and The Rock times 10. Oh, that's, wow. So he's huge in right, Japan. Right, enormous in Japan, yeah. right? I mean, even today, he's a politician. He's 73, and he's one of the most recognizable faces in Japan. Oh, wow. <laughs> so he is, he's an important cultural figure. Okay. Um, and he, his history can be traced directly to this man named Ricky Dozan, who's the founder in the, of pro- Japanese professional wrestling. Okay. So um, he is just quite a character. I mean, he has his own story and his own life, and I don't think it's any coincidence that he was the one that was able to lure Muhammad Ali into this contest. So this is his brain. This, this. His doing. But it's the first sports entertainment fight in, in sports history? Well, no, not necessarily. I think, yes, you can make an argument it is, although the WWF, that's what it was in 1976, right. was doing some of these larger shows. The, the pro wrestling at the time was basically stripped into territories. There wasn't one dominant brand. Okay. So you had shows out in California, which were happening like at the Olympic Auditorium. It was, uh, you had them all over the country. So the Pacific, uh, the, sorry, the, the Northeast was the WWF, the McMahon family. Uh-huh. Um, and they, yeah, who we all used to watch in the 80s. Right, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. once the 80s came around, they became the WWF, and they started consolidating. And where I think this is the genesis of sports entertainment is that Vince McMahon, I'm call him Junior, I don't he doesn't like that, but the guy who's running the business now, Vince Kennedy McMahon, um, he, was, he had ambitions that his father didn't. His okay. father wanted to play within the old structure, the kid was like, no, we can do more than this. He had a bigger, he, he, he had a bigger appetite, right? And so for him to have pro wrestling associated with Muhammad Ali ah. in this kind of big closed circuit event, it really fed into his idea of where wrestling can go and how we can draw audiences. And so to me, this this event was a real sort of moment for him to understand that. And it led to the the advent of what they call now is it's not pro wrestling, it's sports, sports, enter- entertainment. sports entertainment. Wait, so did, was the McMahon family, family involved in creating this match between Anoki and o- Ali? Yeah, they were. Um, they were. So what happened was in 1975, Ali made a comment to a very famous Japanese wrestler, like a legit, like Olympic wrestler. Mm-hmm. Um, he said uh, his words: "Is there no Oriental man who can challenge oh. me?" And he threw down like a, you know a million he threw bucks, down the gauntlet, th- yeah. million buck challenge. So Inoki heard this, and immediately this ambitious guy um, f- said, "Okay, let's. How do we put this together?" So he leveraged all the money he had with his investors, and he said. Here, let's let's do this. Uh, they went to Bob Arum, who was promoting Muhammad Ali, okay. and said, "We're interested." Arum was like, "Okay, heard him." Went to Vince McMahon and said, "Well, can we do? How do we do closed circuit? How do we bring in wrestling around this?" And so, wait, what does that mean, closed circuit? Like, so basically, how we you know today we'll click a button and we'll watch pay per view, right? right? Right. Closed circuit essentially was. No one could do that. There was no, there was no way for people at their homes to do to watch these a, events. Correct, direct so, link into their cameras or right. what well, they're seeing. What they had to do was go to an arena or go to a stadium. Right. And it was projected, and oh. so people came together and watched these events. Uh. That's interesting. Yeah, so all around the country, there was closed circuit events, and they were all tied into pro wrestling. And what the McMahons did for this event was bring all the different territories together and say, okay, you're big stars. You go out and wrestle that night, and then we'll beam in from we'll, Tokyo. Oh, the match. that's genius! Yeah, yeah, it really was. Shea Stadium in New York, which is the old home of the Mets. I mean, uh-huh. over thirty-two thousand people came out. Seriously? Th- wow! To watch the closed circuit, and then at Shea Stadium, Andre the Giant had a pro wrestling match against Chuck Wepner. Oh wow! They made it look like a real fight. It wasn't a real fight, but um, yeah, it was. It all played together. They call uh-huh. it a, a night of martial arts, boxing versus wrestling. It was like these worlds colliding. So they had Andre the Giant uh, fighting a boxer. Yes, Chuck Webner, who had fought Ali and had actually knocked down Ali. He was Chuck Webner was the inspiration for Rocky Balboa. Nice. Yeah. Okay. He's, so he's then in the book. These, he's these a fights were all works. They were all works. The Ali Inoki fight was not. It was a shoot. It was a real fight. It was a real fight. Yeah. And it was always supposed to be a real fight. No. Initially, it was supposed to be a work. Okay. So the Mc, Vince McMahon, the elder, the father, proposed. He scripted it out. Bob Arum thought it would be a great idea, and Ali. You know, the idea was for Ali to, to take a fall, and uh, Ali was like, "Ali was like, no, no way, no I'm way. Muhammad Ali. I can't see that dude going. Yeah, I'll take yeah, a fall, especially like in the prime, in his yeah, prime. And, and <laughs> this is at the height of his yeah. his, oh, his popularity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, really, this, um, you know, the, the match takes place eight months after the Thrill in Manila. So, oh wow! Yeah, and he had he was so active, and it was this, the height of his fame. Um, he was probably starting to decline as a boxer at this point. You know, he'd, he'd taken so much damage. But um, in terms of world renown, I mean, I don't know, the Pope maybe yeah. was like, you know. Well, back then, I mean, you're, you, you only have who the media puts on 
and, and he, fame, he, and he, he was, was it. He was yeah. it. He was everywhere. Yeah. One of the great things about you know researching the book is that obviously I couldn't speak to him for this book. Right. Um, but there was so much in the media and so many quotes from him and so much uh, sort of you know interviews and, and newspaper stories about this event that I was able to have his voice in there pretty consistently. And plus, I was able to draw from um, the footage of the closed circuit, the footage of uh, uh, the Japanese broadcast, and wow. um, I was ac- I got access to some of the press conference stuff and some of the dinners around the event in Tokyo. Uh-huh. So there's a lot of Ali's voice in this. Yeah. Did it, you ever get to meet oh, him? I'm he, sorry. He's been chiming. He's been yeah. trying to chime. Sorry. In for oh a while. no no no. Um, I, if you don't know the ex- exact figures, that's fine. But do you know roughly how many people went and saw the the closed cat? The uh, I don't know exactly how many five? watched, but I know yeah. that it was uh, beamed potentially to 1.4 billion, is what they said. There was over 100, 150 uh, locations in the U.S. Wow. Yeah, um, is my understanding, and then you know worldwide too. I mean, in, in London, I would imagine and, everywhere people were watching yeah, this. Yeah, 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 definitely. Especially in event. Japan too. In Japan for sure. In um, Korea, no, no, everywhere. Did you ever get to meet him? Muhammad Ali, I, I didn't get to meet him and have a conversation. I've been in the same room with him a couple times. Mm-hmm. Um, there was one uh, kickboxing event, K1 event in Las Vegas, like in 2002 that I covered. And um, just a regular night of kickboxing. And I'm not much for kickboxing, quite honestly. It, it kind of bores me. Really? Yeah, I love MMA. I think MMA is much more interesting. Uh, the grappling dynamic to me changes everything. I agree. And, um, you know, and I love boxing. It's weird, but the kickboxing just seems foreign and European to me. I'm not I'm not into it. And uh, yeah, I don't know why. Weird European. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And people hear that and like, oh, my God, the knockouts. I'm like, I just don't need to see you guys get knocked out for entertainment purposes. That's I, not, I'm that's with not you. Where, that's not where I'm at. But uh, there was this kickboxing event, and the room was kind of slow and dead, but it was full. It was a ballroom, I think, at the Bellagio. And all of a sudden, people started murmuring in the crowd, and you realize Muhammad Ali's walking in the room. The whole energy in the room shifted. Oh. It just lifted 100 what times. What year was this? I think it was 2002 or 2003. So he was still like pretty mobile. Maybe not he super could, vocal, but. Yeah, he could move around. He was shaky. I mean, you know, but he could, he could you know, still walk. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it I don't was. Think it matters when he walks in the oh, room. He, it does yeah, not know, matter. Absolutely not. My, my brother met him once, um, and my brother uh, was sort of an early pioneer for the yoga movement in the mm-hmm. U.S. And um, uh, he was at a dinner, and Ali happened to be there. And Ali overheard my brother talking about yoga, and I guess Ali was somehow interested in it. Really? They went over and chatted for about ten minutes, and then after the conversation, my brother's like, "Wow, I just met Muhammad Ali. That's that's great." Um, Fifteen minutes later, one of Ali's guys comes over. He's like, "Hey, what's your phone number? He, he wants to he wants to talk to you more, more about the yoga." And my brother's like. Okay, fine. Here, take it. Like, I'll never hear from Muhammad right, Ali again. Right. Two weeks later, he gets a phone call, and it's Muhammad Ali. <gasps> Wait, it's actually Muhammad, it's Muhammad Ali, Ali on the phone. Yeah. Oh, but you got to you got to understand this about Ali. Like, he that's who he was. First of all, he had this energy that was boundless. Right. Literally, like I don't. People around him had no idea where he got it from. They thought that he would be exhausted. And he wanted more and more and more. And then he just wanted to touch people. It didn't matter if you were the most famous man, if you were the president of the United States or some regular person on the street. He wanted to have an interaction with you. And then those interactions, because I've talked to a lot of people who have met Ali Mm -hmm. through the process of writing and researching the book, and they all have this amazing story. And to them, it's like one of the most greatest moments in their lives for Muhammad Ali, just a regular day. That's how he rolls. Yeah, Yeah. and he did. He wanted people to have a positive exchange with him always, and he had this sort of... Uh, the way Ferdy Pacheco, who's his longtime physician, framed it was like they became drunk in love with Ali. He, wow. he touched them. He had this way about him, and I, yeah, I, I believe that. I he mean, has he the received, it factor. He, he absolutely had it more than anybody. Has that's, um, that's amazing. Have, have yeah. you, has his family or his people? read your book or have they been involved in it? Have you talked to them? Um, I talked to a lot of people who are around him, uh, people who were close to him, advisors and things like that. Um, I think some of them are starting to read the book. I, I haven't spoken directly to his family. Um, it was a, you know, it was a tough one for me. I was like, do I reach out? Cause I know that I had all these voice and I had his thoughts both in recollections from people who were close to him, who were with him at the event and mm-hmm. also all the stuff that was in the newspapers at the time. And so I didn't know how much I needed to burden the family and bother them. And I understand that he was ailing and he wasn't doing very well. So I didn't I didn't go out and, and bug them too much. But hopefully hopefully they will see the book. I know that I should probably send them a few copies and, yeah. and, and have them see that. Look, I, I think I portray uh, the real Ali. Um, there are some things in there in terms of his philandering and women, and there's some stories in there about in, about that. Um, but it's the real person. I mean, we all have our foibles. We all have our sure. weak spots. And, um, you know, I, 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 what I was was honest and as I, as I always try to be in terms of portraying people. And, yeah. um, I think it's a very fair telling of Muhammad Ali during that period. Yeah. 
Have you been in touch with Anoki's people? Yeah, I was in touch with the Anoki's people quite a lot. His son-in-law, Simon Anoki, um, I interviewed. Um, they promised me multiple interviews with Antonio Anoki. Never got it. Uh -huh. um, you know, the pro wrestling business is tough because they don't really want to give you too much, right? They sure. don't want to lift because the, then you yeah, become then, a real person. Yeah, yeah they don't want to yeah. lift the veil, and they definitely don't want to talk to someone who's going to ask them harder questions and like sort of like you know. So they don't want you to the real. Yeah, what, the, what really yeah. is happening? I, I tried as hard as I could to get uh, Vince McMahon, the WWE, to participate and talk to me, and not having know, it. They didn't mm -hmm. want it, and um, in the end, Enoki didn't speak to me. I wish he had. Um, I think the book would have only benefited from him, but I don't think sure. the book misses his voice. Mm -hmm. And again, through the media reports, through other things through recollections, through talking to Simon and people around him, I feel like I get a really good sense of uh, who he was and what he meant and, um, you know, what was going on with him during that period of time and where he came from, too. It's a, it's a very interesting story just on his own. There's so many characters in the book who do have their own books multiple times over. I mean, it's just this crazy confluence of people. Uh, wow. Yeah. Well, you, you spoke about that you, you did a lot of research on the, on the newspaper articles and the, and the interviews. Oh, there's so much media now leading up to fights and when you look at fighters like Conor McGregor and they use the media so well I'm obviously a little too young to have watched Ali fight but in all of the coverage after his death it was just, it was so he, he, he it was so fun watching him do press what was it like what was the press like that you found from the 70s like was, is it similar to today is it different M amazing um, this is this fight so the boxing press hated this fight, but they still, everybody covered it because it was Ali. Because it's Ali, yeah. Right? <laughs> and um, the week leading up to the fight, all the national, the big newspapers throughout the country had coverage of this daily. Um, it was amazing. I was actually shocked by how much media there was, quite honestly. Um, and I get that. I was like, well, it's a different media age, and you know, everybody's sort of commenting and has blogs, and it just seems like this deluge of information with Twitter and Facebook. Right. But... There was so much media generated around Muhammad Ali, even for yeah. an event like this where people thought it was like a joke and an exhibition and it wasn't real. Um, you know, they didn't really understand what it was at the time, but uh, there was a ton of stuff created around him. It was really helpful. And because now there's a lot of it, but I feel like it probably gets diluted because back then, how many, maybe there's three newspapers in a big city. Mm. So maybe, right. so they, they say, the same amount of eyes, in theory, are reading the articles. It's just they only have a certain number of places. Yeah, so much more controlled media space, for sure. But they're still creating a ton of content. And that's why the, the newspapers had much more power back then. Sure. And it was a much uh, different business, you know. So they, they actually carried a lot of weight. And unlike, unfortunately, they don't do so much anymore. It's a, I don't think it reflects well on us. But, um, yeah, it, there was plenty of media generated around this and around Ali. And um, it, was, it was a lot to dig into. And, you know, I, I covered two Ali's in the book. I cover Ali pre Sonny Liston before he wins the championship. You know this kid coming up. He had two. He had three fights in Los Angeles in 1962, and I write an entire chapter about his experience in L.A. and how those that period was really influential for him in terms of he he had this ability, of course, to captivate. Right? I mean, mm -hmm. just speaking very eloquent, and he could come up with these rhymes. He just had a natural ability to do that. But he wasn't the brash showman that he became. And but this period was influential for that. Uh, he was around pro wrestlers a lot, Olympic Auditorium, Gorgeous George, Classy Freddie Blassie. I mean, really big, important characters in his life. Uh, Classy Freddie Blassie went with him to Tokyo for the Inoki match. He was his manager. So, and then I and then after the thrill in Manila. So I cover two Ali's: the beginning of his career and the end of his career. Um, and uh, I think you have really an idea of of how he shifted so much later in life. So, do you think that? The influence of the wrestlers that he was around, that's where he came out, came up with the idea of his persona. Because we've it. all, I'm sure a lot of people have read the story um, when he was uh, preparing to fight George, maybe George Foreman, one of the other fighters um, that didn't have any money and they got, uh, Ali got in his car mm -hmm. and he was like, hey champ, here's some money. I just want you to, you know, make sure you're taking care of yourself. And then he got out and slammed the door and started just talking smack right away, but not about that instance, just right back onto the show and mm -hmm. the promotion of the show. So, right. Spending time with wrestlers, do you think there was something that he was like, I, I see that, and 100%. I'm going to be the person who the does that in, part of it. in 100, 100, boxing? 100, 100 percent. And that's one thing I really try to do is explain that in the book and show that, show the influence of these showmen, these wrestlers on Ali during that period. It was well known, the story about his affinity for someone like Gorgeous George, who is a huge wrestler in, in America in the 1940s and 1950s. Um, they crossed paths in Las Vegas in 1960. Uh, Ali had one of his early fights, his first fight in Vegas. And th at the same venue, I think it was the, the next night the wrestling was happening. It was actually Gorgeous George against Freddie Blassie. Mm -hmm. So um, 
there's no question that these people had an enormous impact on who he was and his brashness and his showmanship and everything that he became. There's no doubt about it. Now, now that wasn't the ahead, only sorry. time the Yanoki fight wasn't the only time he fought a wrestler, right? In the lead up to this, well, it was the only time he f- had a real fight against a wrestler. Okay. He had a couple pro wrestling matches, work matches, building up to the promotion. They were on the wild, wide world of sports. So in that month, as a boxer, or he was on there as a wrestler. Well, he was playing himself, yeah. so he was ah. a, he was a boxer. But he did pick up one guy and, and slam him, and he kind of beat these guys up. But they that all that was scripted out to okay. build up to the event, to the Inoki match. Oh, I yeah. see. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. that's yeah. really interesting. Cool. So. Um, you're not a fight fighter fan, but are you an Ali fan? Um, I mean, you have to be. I mean, <laughs> I, I feel like uh, I feel like we should be privileged to have lived in the age of Muhammad Ali, right? I mean, right. you know, to have lived at a time where even you know, I'm 40, so I don't remember his fights so much. Maybe the very tail end of his career, but for younger people, I think that I hope that they have some understanding of how important he was. Um, you know, all you had to do was watch his funeral and yeah. how amazing that was and how he engineered it to be that way to send a message in terms of unity and all these sorts of really important social conscious messages that never escaped him that were always incredibly important to him Mm -hmm. you know more than just being a celebrity now we're just in the age of celebrity where it's very easy to become a celebrity and doesn't really mean that much Um, he was a celebrity because he deserved to be because of who he was his accomplishments as an athlete and also well beyond that just in terms of everything that he had the missions that he had the 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 way that he portrayed himself the things that were important to him the causes that he advocated for um you know, I, I don't it's think it's pretty I'm, hard not to be a Muhammad Ali fan. I, I mean, oh. if you're not, um, there's probably some other stuff going on in your life that makes you not like people like Muhammad Ali. Right. Even if you're him. not a boxing fan, like just as a I person, just people, as a person. I, I don't know any. I don't think I've ever met anybody. If you ever talk about him that doesn't like Muhammad Ali and, and think just know what a legend he is. He right. was I mean, um, of all the things about Ali, I mean, he was just a pure fighter. So whether whether he was fighting an opponent in the ring or fighting the U.S. government, or whatever it was, mm-hmm. whatever he believed in was what he, he believed in, and he fought for that and he, as hard as he could. And I yeah. think there's some really important messages there that I hope people understand about his life and take away from that um, and apply to their own lives because I think sometimes people are too willing to give in to things mm-hmm. uh, when they think they have no hope. There is always hope, and a guy like Muhammad Ali always showed that. Yeah. yeah. Um, about your writing, so I know you've, you've talked about that you don't write as a fan and um, that you're not there to paint any promotion in a certain light so you're are you talking to the fans when you're writing what do you just want people to get information or do they you want them to hear your voice and and do you want to communicate something to them i mean i don't it really depends i guess on the piece um whether i'm writing a feature story or um, i mean i guess sometimes i write opinion and i do columns Mm -hmm. so that but i always write with my voice i write like i talk Mm-hmm. And that's the only way that I've ever known to do it. I was a terrible English student. I was terrible at grammar. I just it was boring to me. I didn't want to do it. I just write like I talk. And so, um, you know, I guess um, I guess my voice comes across because of that. But, uh, you know, I, I'm never consciously trying to have uh, people sort of manipulate a story or have try, try to paint a certain person or an organization some way or mm-hmm, one or the right. other. Um, and I hope that comes across. What I want people to get is a clear understanding of what I'm writing about and mm-hmm. to be, you know, to absorb it and for it to be entertaining. I want people to, I want my writing to be good enough where they can go through an entire piece. Sometimes I write really long pieces. Last year I wrote a piece for Sports Illustrated that was 12,000 words. Jesus, and that's really long. Yeah, so, <laughs> so um, well, the book was 73,000 words. And, um, you know, as long as it's entertaining for people and they get some pleasure out of it, that's really what I'm hoping for, yeah. Was it diff- is it difficult to, or when you started writing to to be able to separate yourself as it was a really, fan? It was really easy for me. Really? Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why I think I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, it was really it was really simple for me. Was it? Um, pretty early on, uh, I had a couple moments where I, I reacted in a way that I said, "Okay, I know that I'm supposed to be doing this." Uh-huh. Uh In California, there was an event. Um, it was kind of a, it was a made for TV event, but they portrayed it like real fights, but it was pretty clear immediately that these were not real fights. They were scripted matches. And I was a young kid. I mean, I was 24 and, um, I went to one of the guys that go, I mean, what are you doing here? This is obviously not real. And they threatened me and they threatened to beat me up if I went and said anything. What? And the next day I'm on the phone with the California athletic commission and saying, what's this, this, and this, what's going on. Oh, so wow. I, I knew that I wasn't going to be intimidated pretty easily by any mm-hmm. of these people, even some of these guys who are fighters and like can be scary if they want to be. Um, that was not something that ever got in the way of what I wanted to do. And, um, you know, it's only benefited my work. It's only benefited what I've tried to do. Yeah. What did you write about that? Did you, did you publish? 
publish that somewhere? I was on the web somewhere? Yeah, I was writing for Full Contact Fighter at the time. That was uh-huh. just when I was starting. Full Contact Fighter was the first place that ever pi- paid me for a piece of, uh, uh, well, one of the pieces that I, I wrote. The first piece I ever wrote was on the California Athletic Commission passing rules okay. for mixed martial arts. This was April 2000. Um, I wrote that piece just... A friend of mine said, hey, why don't you just write a story and send it out to people? Yeah. And I did. And a couple places picked it up, including Full Contact Fighter. I became their kind of guy on the West Coast. I started covering King of the Cage and all these events up and down California. And soon enough, I started, you know, Pride. I started going to Pride, um, wow. you know, and started going Does to these events. Does that mean they fly? Does Pride fly? Who flies you out to these so, events? So one of the things that was, I will never allow a promoter directly to pay for my travel. That makes sense like that. because then you become beholden to right. them. Somehow. So, but, this, but there's no doubt that Full Contact Fighter had like a, an arrangement with Pride where they would do like a content exchange. So it was like, you pay for advertising, we'll send a guy out. No one ever told me what to write or what to do. But, you know, even that is really prickly. Yeah, really. Because sure. you know, if you write something really bad, that's not going to go over well no matter what. Well, and yeah, but it, it, it's just yeah. like for a journalist to have sort of uh, that idea. And, I, you know, again, I didn't care. I was I, What I did was just say, take the access. And um, I'm not getting paid directly by the promotion. This is a deal that the people that I'm working for arranged. And, you know, in a perfect world, that's not something you would really want to do. I would never, you know, recommend that, you know, people engage in those kinds of deals. But quite honestly, I was a kid and I didn't know much. Right. You were and young. You were probably yeah. trying to break into. And, and I didn't things. really know much about the dynamics of what right. was happening with the people that I was working for in Pride. So, um, you know, all I, all they said was, hey, go to the airport this time. There's, there's a ticket. We got a ticket for you and go to Japan. Mm-hmm. And I was like, OK, cool. let's, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Do you participate in online forums like um, the Underground? Uh, I've had a, a UG. I've had a UG account forever. I'm a. I'm a. Whatever the date is, like right. the, the 2000. When they they. I was on there well before 2000, but then they did some rollover. So like the earliest accounts are like January 2000. I have one of those accounts. Nice. I think I've posted like 60, 70 times since 2000. That's it. Yeah, I don't do, go on do, there. Do people try and engage you? Uh, if I jump on there, but I oh. honestly don't go. I don't even look at it. Um, I for me, interaction with fans is on Twitter. Really? You know, so what is your interaction with fans like? Um, what's your relationship with fans like? Um, I give and take. I mean, I'm happy to hear what they say. Mm-hmm. I'm not above criticism. If I screw up, I want to know. And I, if people have opinions that are different than mine, I want to know. I like debate. So I'm always willing to defend myself, and I think I can do it pretty well. And, um, you know, uh, that's basically what it is. I'm very engaged with, with the people on my Twitter page. I don't have Facebook. In fact, I don't like Facebook. I don't trust Facebook. So I use... You don't, uh, tru- wait, you don't yeah, trust Facebook? Yeah, what does that mean? Just, just, <laughs> just the way that the data is used and the information is used. I'm not interested. Oh, because we're all products? We're, I guess. We are what they're peddling? <laughs> it's a weird because, like, I use a bunch of Google stuff, so it doesn't really add up. But in my right. mind, you know, it's it's one of my weird inconsistencies. I'm not above them. But I just prefer not to be on Facebook. Let's just put it that way. Gotcha. And... Um, um, I do like Twitter. I think Twitter for media people really makes a lot of sense. Um, I've learned so much about um, topics and the way the world works through Twitter. And, you know, it's one of these great Internet things. It was like with the book, you know, I don't know what it's like to write a book without the Internet. And yeah. uh, it, it's got to be such mo- such a more intensive process where you're just going through microfilm and you're really sort of digging through books and just a more arduous process. You know, for me, I, this is the example I've been using is like, did you know in, in World War II that Japan landed a strike on the continental United States? Did you know that? No. Yeah, I didn't know like that. Like not Hawaii? No, not Hawaii. No, the con- yeah. Yeah, I didn't know when? that. When? Where? Uh, it was in the state of Washington or Oregon. I forget which one. It was. I think it was the state of Oregon. Um, so what the Japanese did was uh, build this secret weapon called the Gung Fu weapon. And the only reason I know this is because I did research into Antonio Inoki, who was obviously connected to Ricky Dozan, and Ricky Dozan was a sumo wrestler, and sumo was suspended during World War II. And oh. why did they suspend sumo during World War II? Because in all the sumo halls, they were building this weapon. They used the sumo halls as a as as, weapon? Because, the, because it was big enough. Basically, these oh. weapons were giant balloons. Manufacturers, that's what I was Yeah, they, they were giant balloons that they floated across the Pacific, and basically they were just hoping to drop the... And these it got incendi- past our radar, the technology they, we had at yeah, the time. Yeah, and they, they, they were like these incendiary weapons. They dropped some bombs and basically wanted to create fires. 
And wow. basically, it was just to create panic in, uh, among the population. So there was a media blackout, the, the things that landed. What? Yeah, it was crazy. Did they hit a populated area? No, the, the, the only people who were killed uh, were campers in, in Oregon, I think it was. Maybe say Washington. I think it was Oregon. Um, like six. It was a, a, Wow. Yeah. Was this before or after um, the bombing of Pearl Harbor? Oh, after. After. This is well, after. This is well into the, this oh, is almost people like a, would have lost their collective this, this mind. Is like, this is like a last-ditch effort that the Japanese are trying wow. to do. Wow. So I had no idea, but because of the internet, and I could dig and sort of like you go into these rabbit holes, yeah, and, and you find all sorts of stuff, and that's in the book, and like you know, really, uh, yeah. Oh, I just. Oh, Becky's yeah. like, I'm gonna read the book when I get home. <laughs> I took a World War II class. Never heard. Never. Yeah. never no, I didn't well, know. There was I a didn't blackout. Know anything Why about would that? you? I, yeah. Well, obviously that was lifted, but yeah. I mean, the Smithsonian uh, had a report out in the 70s, and it, it's just I learned all this stuff. It was kind of wild. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. I thought Lee was. I thought you were about to say something. Are you looking it up? Oh no, I was gonna. I was gonna go look it up. But it's just. It's. Um, it was interesting when you said that me, Twitter's really good for media people. Mm -hmm. You write very different lengths of, of pieces. You have your articles, you have books, and you have Twitter. And Twitter's only 140 characters. Is it the same process for you, or is it totally different? Um, always editing. So I'm self-editing constantly on Twitter. Uh, I enjoy that. No. Can I you mean, edit your tweets? Well, just before you put it out. Like, oh, gotcha. You know, so in, in my mind. Make I'm, it 140 I'm, characters. I'm, I'm, always, of... I'm always editing and thinking. and um, it. I, in some ways, it's sharpened my writing because you have to be concise. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, I, I just, yeah, I don't go on long rants on Twitter. I don't think that's the right platform for that. And I also have other spaces that I can write in. And um, But, you know, sometimes I can be pithy and say, Smart ass comments, and it's good for it's good for that sort of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Do you engage with other people in the sport, like uh, Big John McCarthy or Joe Rogan or Mike Beltran or you know any sure, of those guys? Sure, yeah, I know I know Joe well, and uh, Joe know John well, and yeah, I mean, uh, I engage with any anyone who wants to engage with me, I'm happy to engage with them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you could, uh, you are just as much a part of the sport as fighters. But in our you, own way. It, I mean, media is of yeah, yeah for any sport they cover, I suppose. Yeah. What'd you think of the whole aerial thing? Are you friends with him? Sure. I was back. I was in New York last week. I was on the MMA beat and spent mm -hmm. some time with him. Um, you know, I think it's a difficult position. The UFC has controlled media in a lot of ways, and their deal with Fox allows them to control uh, the talent on those shows. And I don't think it's a fair position to put a media person in to say, you know, if you want to go work on Fox television, that you have to be paid by the UFC. But that's the dynamic there is, and so it's a really difficult choice. Yeah. Uh, I I know it's something that he didn't want to participate in, but he did. Um, you know, uh, I think it's a joke that he was thrown out during the event and all sorts of, you know, it's sort of just insane. It makes the UFC look small and petty. Yeah, um, I mean, it, yeah. so what? That you, t you told everybody about Brock? I, first of all, I was sitting in the audience and people were talking about it, but in a really excited way. Yeah, like, I feel silly. like it kind of people were excited worked in their favor. Like, like I'm sitting with Rich Layton, who does color commentary with me, and he's like, dude. Yeah. And, and we just, we started talking about it in the uh, uh, the fight started and we all got excited and people were chatting about it. It's, um, I think it's totally, it's, it's silly. Uh, unfortunately, that's one of the good things. I talk a lot about how great Zufa has been for the UFC. One of the things that I think they've been pretty awful in is their interactions with media. I speak from my own personal experiences. So um, I, the fact that they're going to throw a guy out, like anyone out during an event for, for breaking news, for doing their job is, is heinous. Right. And then for to do it, I think that they didn't realize, um, you know, my reaction on Twitter was, you know, this is a new day and age. Zufa just shit the bed. This is this is going to be a big, big uh, firestorm. And it was um, bigger than I could have imagined. But uh, certainly I don't think they expected the kind of backlash that they got. And yeah. I think you saw that by the retraction when they threw me out in 2005 and a lot of the media out. We tried to voice our discontent, uh, but there was it was a small space. No one really cared about MMA at the time. Right. And it was a different deal. So And they, did they actually throw you out of an event or they were just like, you can't come back? No, they, they didn't credential us. But it wasn't just me. They threw out all the MMA media at the time. Really? Yeah. Everybody? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Who yeah. was that at the time? It was SureDog. SureDog, um, full, time, full Contact Fighter. Uh, there was a bunch of other websites. Uh, Bloody Elbow. M was Bloody Elbow? No, right? MMA Weekly. Um, yeah. I mean, there was there was a few of us who'd been around for a while. And so who were they letting in to do their media? Well, this was after the Ultimate Fighter 1, and they started expecting regular media, more more media coverage. Mm -hmm. Oh. So, and it was weird because after the Ultimate Fighter, um, actually after... UFC 52, I think, when Chuck Liddell fought uh, Randy Couture, you know, because we had the Ultimate Fighter, and then the following week they were going to fight on pay-per-view. Dana White literally got in front of the press during the press conference and thanked specific people and said, thank you for the MMA media, thank you for all your support. 
which is nice to hear. doesn't really mean much. I don't really need to hear that from the people I cover, but hey, right. that's a nice thought. And then just a couple months later, they're, we're all you out. You gotta go. Hmm. Yeah. Because you're not um, saying what I want you to say. Well, right? their, their justification was that, you know, people were doing business that they didn't like about DVDs, but that had nothing to do with the right. content we were creating or the journalism we were doing. So I never bought that. To me, it was just a control issue. And mm -hmm. it always has been. Yeah. I, no I noticed that ever since uh, the aerial thing, you know, he came out and he said his piece. And then later that day, they said, okay, ban left it or whatever. Nobody really, th nobody talked about it afterwards. I feel like it yeah. kind of all went. Yeah, I think that was one of the reasons. Swept under the rug. Well, that was one of the reasons why they backed so quickly away from it was because I think they realized that the story was getting a lot of traction. They didn't want to take that firestorm. And, you know, I think also some of the things that Ariel revealed um, in terms of the, his business relationship mm -hmm. with the. Uh, the Fox and Zufa, and, you know, where the money was coming from. I think some media people, more mainstream media people may have looked at that and said, well, that's, that's a little odd, but, um, you know, I, I was, I, it wasn't a secret to me. I mean, I was, if you're in the business, you're aware of those relationships and you're aware that no one's on Fox covering UFC unless the UFC wants them to be on Fox covering the UFC. That's just the way wow. it works. Yeah. Hmm. Do you see yourself going back to a big corporation like ESPN or something like that? I don't know. I mean, most, I don't know. I, I'd be open to it. I love the sport. I love covering it. I do want to write more books. Mm -hmm. um, people have to buy this one. For so, sure. You yeah. know, we'll Go see. buy it. Yeah. And um, I don't know. Um, I know that I am not a business guy who will create my own space and monetize my own content. I just know that it's not what I'm built to do. So we can't expect sure. the Josh Gross podcast to come back? Well, the Gross Point Blank <laughs> podcast is something that a lot of people are bugging me about returning. I uh -huh. put it on hiatus it's when I did the book. Too. Yeah. Um, if a fan gave it to me years ago, Gross Point Blank. It was really solid, and I've, I've taken it. I always appreciated that. Um, I would love to do it again. I really would, but it's just got to be the right scenario for it. Yeah. Yeah. Would you team up with a fighter to be like a co-host? Mm, not really interested in that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying never, but um, it's not something that would be. I've never really thought about it or reaching out to any fighter to, to do that. No. Yeah. Or maybe yeah. ex-fighter. Someone who's not fighting. Possibly. It's just a thought. Yeah. I have no idea. No, I mean, I, I used to do a podcast with TJ DeSantis over at Sure Dog uh, mm -hmm. called Beatdown. And that was fun, that dynamic of being with someone and having that banter and going back and forth. But I do like the platform to have my sort of voice and carry mm -hmm. a show. Um, I, I think that, that suits me really well. And, um, you know, hopefully if I get back to it, which I'd like to do, you know, it'd be in that format. TJ's staying pretty busy. He's the commentator for EBI. Do you watch EBI? Uh, I've been to a couple of them. I mean, it's literally two blocks from where I live in downtown L.A. Yeah. So uh, I've known Eddie Bravo for a long time. Um, and Eddie's a, one of these guys a long time ago. I, I've written some stuff about Eddie that was really harsh about Eddie. And, oh, you know. Cool. Um, but Eddie's always been extremely professional and gracious with me, and I appreciate that. Um, you know, I think he recognizes that I'm just expressing myself and whatever yeah. my opinion was, and um, he's been he's been good about that. A lot of people have. A lot of people have. What do you think of EBI as a promotion? Oh, and then I have another promotion question for you. Um, <laughs> I have so many questions. <laughs> I think uh, I think the grappling business is a very difficult one. Um, even though I've done jiu-jitsu for a while, I don't really enjoy watching jiu-jitsu so much. Even the way that EBI does it? Well, I think the way that he does it is pretty entertaining. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, at a certain point, it's like you have to manipulate the rules so much to engage action. Like, what exactly are you selling? So I'm not. I'm not sure. It's okay. It's okay. I, I would prefer watching EBI over over like Glory Kickboxing or anything like that. So interesting. Yeah. Well, speaking of, so what do you think has been the most exciting promotion rules wise to watch? Mm, man, you know, I, I think mixed martial arts manages to excite kind of no matter what. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, the old Pride rules were pretty intense, but Pride changed their rules along the way, too. You know, they went from Pride 12 to Pride 13, and all of a sudden you can knee a guy in the head when he's down and kick him in the face, mm -hmm. and that changes things a lot. You know, when rules are less restrictive, obviously it gets more intense. Um, I thought, I, look, I think the UFC has had incredible fights. I think Pride has had incredible fights all up and down the line. Um even Pancrase, Pancrase with its open hand striking way back when, you know, there were some amazing bouts. So I'm open to all of it. I think one of the interesting things about MMA is it's a sport in flux, mm -hmm. although we've seen a lot of this movement towards the unified rules and, you know, five minute rounds and these 10 point must. And that's kind of what MMA is now. Um, you're still seeing organizations like 1FC expand and do different things. I'm, Wait, I'm, what's 1FC doing different with the rules? Well, they're more like that pride style. So okay. you can soccer kick a guy when he's down and you can need Really? Him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they do it. I mean, I'm not, I don't need soccer kicks, honestly. I don't, I don't need, need soccer I, kicks I, in the face. I'm good with that. Yeah. I do love the knees, though. I think the knees change everything. So um, When they're down? Yeah, when they're down. 
because um, it, it definitely opens up the action. So, I, you know, I'm I'm open for any mixed style fighting. To me, anything that combines grappling and striking, I'm I'm into. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm with you. Jujitsu can be super boring, like especially anything can be super boring. Yeah, yeah. I've seen some like really sometimes terrible. Sometimes you're like, oh, please. I've really seen some terrible something. fights. Yeah. I mean, this Ali Inoki match. A lot of people are going to think it's boring. Its legacy is that it's a terrible farce of a fight. Well, the only clip yeah. that I saw was Inoki on his back, kind of butt scooting towards Ali, and then Ali Kicking grabbing his, his yeah. leg and kind of not not quite leg dragging, but just kind of like dragging him. Yeah. Is that how the whole fight goes, or do you know what is it in the is it in the book? Well, everybody, yeah. In the, yeah, well, it's certainly in the book. I spent uh, a really uh, in depth chapter on the fight. I spent mm-hmm. one chapter on the fight, and um, you know, the match itself is basically Inoki diving in Ali's lead leg and mm-hmm. kicking his lead leg without the good Imanari rolls that he should have. Right, it was not <laughs> there was not a lot there, but you, I mean, he was wearing wrestling boots like professional wrestling boots that were laced up to the midway through his shin, and Ali's lead leg by the midway point of the fight is blown up double inside. I mean, his leg was really, really. Badly. Wait, it was Inoki kicking him? Yeah, mm-hmm. uh-huh. over a hundred times he got mm-hmm. kicked. So uh, uh, Ali's leg was badly damaged. Wow. Um, Are we talking like Uriah Faber after fighting? After, um, uh, uh, Jose, Jose Aldo. Aldo. I mean, bad. I he mean, was in crutches for a few days. Pretty, after. pretty close. Uh, Ali, after the match, went to Korea for three days on a tour, and he was in pain. And then came back to the states, and immediately, when I got off the plane in Los Angeles, went to a hospital in Santa Monica. Whoa. And he was in the hospital for four days and was on what? blood yeah, thinners. That's pretty bad. Oh my god. Yeah. No. I mean, he was he was doing road work again six weeks later. So, you know, he got back into it, but definitely a lot of damage. There was concern among people in his camp that blood clots may get to his heart, may get oh, to his shit. brain. I mean, uh-huh. it, there was. The thing about Ali, you know, he slowed down over the course of his career, but he always could rely on his legs. He could always rely on them for defense and for movement. And then after this fight, that was basically it. This was the last straw. So you really saw the decline of his uh, of him physically. He never knocked anyone down again after this fight. So, mm, wow. you know, that definitely had an impact on him physically. Yeah, even if people think it was boring or whatnot, I mean, there's no doubt that this, fa- that this contest had a lot to do with Ali's end of the line physical demise. Yeah. What was the rule setting for that fight since... It was a crazy... I spent a lot of time in the book about the rules. A lot of people at the time didn't know what they were. Uh Uh, There was a few different rule combinations that were released to the public. It was style versus style, right? Right. So it was pro wrestling versus boxing. Mm -hmm. All these folks just simply wanted to protect him as much as they could. So they tried to strip away as much as they could for Inoki, which is one of the reasons why he did the tactic of diving in with the kicks. Because they said, you can't stand and kick. Uh, you, part of you has to be down on the ground when you kick. Really? Yeah. Huh. Um, but there was there was like pro wrestling things like rope escapes. So if uh, if Ali got tied up or was something happened an impossible submission, all he had to do was touch the rope and they would separate, <laughs> which is a straight pro wrestling rule. Are you serious? Yeah, is and it? that's that's an old Pancrase rule too. So if you go watch the old Pancrase fights, yeah, safe. Yeah. So that's like. Let me move you out of bounds to yeah. reset us. Yeah, I mean yeah. that's that's old Pancrase rules, and Pancrase comes directly from this. Comes directly from this fight. So, yeah, it's pro wrestling and, and, and combat sports coming together. Okay, so <laughs> how did this become? How did it, how did it launch MMA? What what was what made it happen? Well, a, f- a few different uh, things. One, it got a generation of martial arts thinking about mixed matches. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there was always what kind of my, what would this what would Bruce Lee do against uh, right. Bruno San Martino? A bunch of Brazilians right. sitting in Brazil eating acai <laughs> bowls, and they're like. <laughs> No, they'd well, already been well, doing that. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> see, the thing is, these kinds of fights have been happening for thousands of years. We uh-huh. know that, right? Going back to ancient Greece and obviously everything that the Gracie family did, Elio Gracie against Kamura in the 1950s. These kinds of fights have been happening. Gene LaBelle had uh, the first televised mixed-style fight in America in 1963 against a boxer named Milo Savage. So these things had been going on, but Muhammad Ali elevated it to a place that, you know, it took it to right. a whole nother level. Right. And uh, so it got a generation of people thinking about it. Beyond that, in Japan, its legacy is direct. Um, it tied pro wrestling and combat sports, which were already connected. Antonio Noki, his whole thing was, I'm a pro wrestler, but I can beat you in a real fight using pro wrestling. That was, he came from the catch wrestling history, the catch <laughs> wrestling lineage, right? Do you this think is, that's a true statement? Yeah. This is not. I mean, besides Josh Barnett, who could do that? But that's Josh Barnett's directly related to this. He's in the book. Okay. Jo- Josh Barnett's history of catch wrestling comes directly from the pro wrestling that came out of this era, from the turn of the century in the 19, uh, from 1900s. Yeah, but Josh uses real. Catch wrestling. I know he uses catch wrestling, but he's also a real fighter. Yeah. But but his so basis. So you think they're is, one and the same? Well, yes. Are you suggesting that um, I that uh, I don't know John Cena could no. could fight a real no 
MMA fighter? No, because pro wrestling in America progressed to the point where it just became entertainment. Okay. It just became sports but back entertainment. Then, back then, it was then, just it was real it. enough. Yeah, in the 1920s, okay. you know who Jack Dempsey is? Yes. So in the 1920s, Jack Dempsey and the number one wrestler in America talked in the press about having a mixed fight, a boxer versus wrestler. He was Ed Strangler Lewis. He was the number one wrestler. He came from this catch wrestling lineage. But back then, the pro wrestlers could actually fight. So they were, they were doing real fighting but inter- with entertainment. That's what it became. Guess who had that idea for an all-girl show? Me. <laughs> Me. Jay yeah. Tan, it's a good idea. It, I mean, that's basically... Is that what you got it from? Was yeah. from pro wrestling? No, I didn't even know this existed, but yeah. now I know that it's a valid Look, uh, American, idea. Look, American pro wrestling that we know of today, like the showmanship and all the weirdness and, you know, the Monday Night It's Raw, a watered-down version of what pro wrestling used to be? No. It's just evolved into this space so it went from Wait, a evolved real, but not with real moves so that's watered down but it's even even today like you'll see like some guy slap on a triangle choke in a, in a wrestling match or some weird like a they'll call it a chicken wing and it traces back to the early roots of pro wrestling which were catch wrestling which were real matches it was basically submission okay. grappling basically ebi and then they just put on a big show with and them. then they would do these matches for four hours and tens of thousands of people didn't matter like literally the streets of paris or small towns in America, mm-hmm. they would be doing these matches. And then they these guys came along and had these ideas. Well, you know, the competition sometimes drags a little bit. How can we make it more exciting? Oh, let's take the sport competition out of it. Let's start scripting it. Let's have gotcha. a traveling group of wrestlers. Mm-hmm. Let's. It, it really evolved into what you know as pro wrestling is today. But along that line, there was real fighting that was passed down, right? Okay. Real submission grappling, which is catch grappling, catch wrestling, which is what right. Josh Barnett knows. Mm-hmm. The guy in Inoki's corner... One of them, his name's Carl Gotch. Josh Barnett trained with Carl Gotch. Carl Gotch was a pro wrestler, but a catch wrestler. He knew how to really do these things. Okay. So that was kind of, that's been kind of lost on the modern day pro wrestling. And again, I'm not a pro wrestling guy. I don't watch pro wrestling as an adult. It's never been something that I've been particularly interested in since I was 12, I guess. And because you're not a 12 year old boy. Because you're. And I, look, people yeah. people enjoy it, and I look. I'm I'm asking. <laughs> <J-Tan>. <laughs> I'm, I'm asking wrestling people to like buy my book, and I don't want to like crap on wrestling. But for me, it, you know, it, because the competition's not there, it's not that appealing for me. Right. Um, Would you like to connects. see? In, in if you got to be the the king of the world, would you like to see um, or the king of sports entertainment? Um, it pro wrestling kind of go back into that that real grappling. Place? No, we have mixed martial arts. Okay, mm-hmm. so we you have. don't want to see Conor McGregor coming in wearing a cape <laughs> and like a big C or you no. know what I mean? No, you know, like Dave Rickles in uh, Bellator coming out like a dinosaur costume and stuff like that doesn't do anything for me. May do something for other people, right? But uh, no, I, I love the sports aspect. I want to know who the best fighters in the world are. And yeah, that's, I agree. That's really the most interesting part of it to me. What? So, what do you think of pro wrestling now? Do you ever have anything like? Well, I follow because of Twitter and because a lot of people in the MMA media space seem to really love pro wrestling. I mean, I get some of it on my feed sometime, but I'm never going to buy a pay-per-view. I'm, I don't sit down and watch Raw. Okay. I'm with you. Um, although I respect the business so much more now because I understand where it came from through the research and the writing of my book. But it's not, Do, it's not my thing. Does uh, like the UFC or other promotions still consult, I don't know, the same publicists that... that- the wrestlers use or have they created their own space like do you see the crossover anymore um no i mean the ufc t- wanted to really zufa really want to understand the wwe business model mm-hmm. when they first came on and they brought in people who were operating like from a business perspective gotcha um and they engineered their business structure like pro wrestling it kind of seems like bellator is doing a little bit of that with the the sh- the fights that are more oh. about the the story and the promotion of it than the actual fight itself? Well, uh, they promote some good fights. They promote a lot of fights that I couldn't care less to see. Right. Um, you know, and, but they're doing it because they have to draw ratings. Right. So, you know, so to each their sure own. I'm sure they've gotten some backlash yeah. from some. Oh, they have. Oh, but I think the, they've gotten a lot of backlash from a lot of people, yeah. but mostly fight nerds that are like, this well, is crap. We don't want to see this. Yeah. yeah. Well, and matchups. So, yeah. Matchups. That are yeah. Like, mm, so when are you going to start doing jujitsu again? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know. I've uh, one of my old friends like picked it up uh, about a year ago. He loves it, and he's been trying to get me on the mat. And my uh, one of my business partners, Bobby Razak, MMA filmmaker. Uh, he and I have a, a fight based production company that we're doing some projects with, and he's a black belt in jujitsu, and he's always trying to get me on the mat. Way back when I armbarred Bobby, so I nice. still I still I still have that. You on can him. still yeah. claim that. Like I, I did armbar you once. I do, just remember. I do. Well, he he brings <laughs> it up forget. too. I think he's bitter about it. So, I, but I, oh yeah, he yeah. wants revenge. Yeah, I'm sure he does. That's so, why he that wants you back on the mat. Are you gonna put on a gi? Or are you gonna do no gi? I always did no gi. I'm not a I'm not a gi guy. Yeah, I'm not a gi guy. 
I'm just saying, either we're not yet nothing. There's nothing wrong with the gi. Nothing. It's, it's just a different game. Yeah, it's it just is. a different game, and I prefer. I always would like reality based situations, and so. I mean, okay, maybe a guy's wearing a jacket, cool, and I can right. lapel choke him, whatever. But uh, I preferred, I mean, we grappled. I did a whole we're, bunch we're of stuff. We're in L.A. How often do you really need a jacket? That's what I'm saying. When's the last time you saw somebody wearing a jacket? <laughs> yeah, that doesn't, not right now. It's too hot. It's too hot right now. <laughs> Lee, what are you doing? Are you, are you paying hmm? attention? Yeah, no. absolutely. <laughs> no, he's, he's zoned out. He's done. How many no, star, no, no. How many how stars, stars are you on? I have a new star. I was just uh, messing with the mixer. No, it was. Um, Is that why I hear volumes changing? Well, yeah, when you guys go, go, I got I don't go like that, but I've noticed. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'll stay right on top of the mic, please, please. They uh, so you know we're in the Joey Diaz studio, and um, there's a lot of edible stars that get eaten around here. A lot of edible stars that get eaten. Edible around. gummy stars. Gum, gummy stars. Are you uh, are you a weed person? I mean, I, I'm born. Are you 420. L- I mean, friendly. <laughs> I don't mind it. I mean, it's L.A., you know. Yeah. It's definitely part of the culture here. It's probably going to be legal by January. So. I hope it is. There's no reason why it shouldn't be. It's yeah. silly. Yeah. I'm, I don't even smoke weed, but I just think yeah. it's silly that it's not. There you go. <laughs> I mean, it's just part of the culture. It's actually surprising um, how normal it is. Yeah, for it's sure. I life. forget. You know, when you go to other states and, like, people are like, we got to, I don't know. I remember being younger and um, being in Arizona and, like, somebody going to, like, to sneak to smoke weed. And mm. I'm like, I don't. What's the sm- what's why, the sneaking? Why, why Everybody's sneaking around. Yeah. yeah, and then it just didn't occur to me like, oh, it's illegal out here. We, people mm-hmm. could get in trouble I'm for in this. A different place. <laughs> yeah. like I'm all for letting adults do what they want. Amen. To do. Yeah. How, what is the uh, scene, I guess, or what is the culture like in the in fighting? I know obviously Nick Diaz and the Diaz brothers are famous for it and for getting caught, but there are a lot. There must be a lot of other fighters who do it on a regular basis. I would imagine. Absolutely. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, uh, there's been as long as I've known. I mean, you know, you go in some hotel uh, hallways after fights, and it doesn't. It's no surprise. <laughs> hey, so, yeah. there's anti-inflammatory properties in weed. I'm sure they smoke it there's, for the anti-inflammatory, for the medicinal, pr- for the medicinal, medicinal purposes, purposes. and well, the, the relaxation purposes. Well, there's actually <laughs> there's a lot of uh, news right now about football players going and 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 trying to lobby the NFL to allow medical marijuana. They should. They get the shit beat out of them. It's everything. Right. Everything's headed yeah. that way. Yeah. Everything's headed that way. Same, same it's with only the fighting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I mean, I to me, it only makes sense. Why? I mean, I don't think pain medication and popping pills is the way to do no, it. Let's so smoke some weed, geez, if, or take if, a you know an edible or whatever. Why not? I mean, if 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 that helps your life and sure. you not hurting anyone else, it seems like right. a totally normal, natural thing, right? It comes yeah. from the ground. So I don't I don't understand what the big deal is. So um, oh, I mean, go I don't, back. I don't know. What? I don't really know what to say about it. Like, I get why they, why people get in trouble for, you know, if they get caught having, having. Oh, Becky. Bored. That's that's why there's an what issue is right there. Becky. Yeah. This is nonsense. <laughs> this is nonsense here. <laughs> um. I don't know why it would be like certain things are banned substances. I feel like I have to hold this because it's gonna fall. Um. Didn't somebody just but, get popped for um, a uh, a supplement that. Is sold b- under the Zufa umbrella? Really? I hadn't heard that about that. No, What's that? am What's I that making about? that up? I don't know. I'm, I've, Somebody I've just been got so popped for a supplement not there. not too long ago, and and I just remember seeing somebody else's compliment. Like, doesn't Zufa sell that? I don't know. Mm. I can't remember. I can't remember the fighter. So this information is completely useless. Mm-hmm. I don't remember. Oh, I, don't I, I, I had the, the guy who just fought McGregor a couple fights ago, Mendez. Oh yeah. Well, it was Z- Chad Mendez. Yeah, I'm pretty really? sure he but got he got popped for something. But I, last I heard, we didn't know what it was. Oh, okay. Huh. Yeah. So you're you're doing your media tour. I'm doing everything. Yeah. Anybody. I mean, I've, I always have been grateful. People have had me on their shows and podcasts and um, always happy to talk about MMA or whatever I'm covering. But yeah, I'm definitely, you know, pushing the book as hard as I can. That's so awesome. When's it coming out? Already? Uh, the book official release date was June 21st. So Yay. yesterday. 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 And uh, thank you. Thank and you. where is it available? Uh, big book retailers, definitely online, Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all those. Um, you know, if you go in a bookstore and they don't have it, please ask for it. Okay. But, uh, yeah, it's, it should be available in most places. And awesome. the date of that fight was, is actually the 40th, 40 year anniversary. 40th anniversary is June 26th. 26th. Yeah, we're, wow. coming, Three, we're coming up four on four days. It. That's why that's we were 40 years ago. Stop saying. Yeah. That's why we released it around this time. <laughs> you know, we thought, thought that made sense. That yeah. Makes yeah. Sense. Well, thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing all this yeah. information with us. Where can people find you? 
Uh, Twitter, uh, at Y-A-Y underscore Y-E-E. Um, I'm writing for The Guardian pretty regularly and um, probably more places in the near future. So, yeah, watch out for that. Awesome sauce. We hope you come back and hang out with us sometime. Anytime. Enjoy it. For sure. Miss Beck, you got some shout outs you want to do? I do. Oh, I should probably have my... Uh... Be prepared, Becky. I'm Get your microphone prepared. together and be prepared. Um, the microphone's not my fault. Thank you very much. Lee Sye. Lee. <laughs> Someone was touching it the whole... <laughs> well, it's like... <laughs> Never mind. Anyways. I'm happy to be here. I'm very grateful. <laughs> what? I can't complain about things in here. Um, so JJ, um, who recently had surgery, get well soon. Hopefully you can be on the mats um, as soon as possible. Yeah, he trains at uh, 10th Planet and Hanu B. J- Hanu BJJ out in the in the IE and he's also a judo guy. He's he's a he's a martial artist. He's What's up JJ? Artist. A mixed martial artist. He's a mixed martial artist. Oh. It's all mixed up, yeah. Um and and Dr. David Gonzalez. Oh my brother. Aww. He gave us a shout out. He, he went gives on a us all the love. Podcast last week and shouted out Matt Therapy. So Thanks. we're shouting him out this week. Yeah. Thanks for all the love and for listening every week cuz I'm pretty sure he's been a listener since the beginning. Yeah. Sometimes we get texts from him. He'll be like <laughs> blah 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 blah. Um so hey DJ. Um and it, is that it? Yeah. Okay. Go for it. <laughs> what you um, got? I got Rose Gracie. Got, we usually try and talk about one woman who does jujitsu. Rose is and awesome. Rose is amazing. Yeah, Rose is awesome. So um, I don't think Rose trains. Maybe she does, but she does run Gracie tournaments. And she this does week, a lot for yeah, this community. They're in Chicago with Gracie regional, Regionals doing a no-gi tournament using EBI rules. She's awesome, and she does so much for the community. She's obviously part of the historic Gracie family and a huge figure in our sport, especially in Nogi, when people weren't giving a lot of um, submission only slash Nogi tournaments, Rose stepped up and, and she started really giving a place for us Nogi, Nogi people to compete. So thank you, Rose, and go to GracieWorlds.com. Check out her... Gracie uh, Worlds or Gracie Tournaments? Well, her website is GracieWorlds.com. Okay. Right. And Gracie Regionals is this weekend. And then you can see when all the other tournaments are. I think they're coming back to L.A. in August, August. and other places. So um, thank you, Rose. We love you. And thank you for representing our sport. Yes, all that. You want to talk about our sponsor before we uh, sign off? Yes. Like usual. Oh, hey, have you oh. ever floated? Um, how do you mean? Isolation tanks? No, I've never done it. No, tanks. no, no. You got to come try it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, well, well, our sponsor we'll, is Just Float. We'll, we'll work that out. Sweet. Yeah, just, yeah. go to justfloat.com if, you, uh, if you're ever in town or if you live here. It's in Pasadena. Um, promo code is MT50. You get 50% off of your first float. Um, go enjoy some meditation time on your own. Go in, zen uh, the fuck out. Zen the fuck out with the uh, fairy dust. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My, we went, my husband and I went a couple weeks ago, and I called her the next day. I'm like, dude, there was fairy dust in that, in that tank. Cause the I was next like, day, what are you talking about? He was so chill. He was like, <laughs> what's up? <laughs> I, I got to try it. Yeah, yeah you, you do have to try it. it. Right. So, yeah, huh? awesome. Josh, thank you so much. That we This was so entertaining and, and interesting having you Great. on and, oh, and all the yeah. stuff that you have to share with us. Bex. I'm going to read your book. Appreciate it. I'm going to read it, too. Um, Bex, where can people find you when they want to talk to you and all the things? Oh, BeckyDominguez.com. Woo-hoo. Finally up and running. You can find all my social media and contact stuff on there. Yep. So, Me too. DonnaGonzalez.com. Ask, ask me questions. Ask yeah. her questions. Ask me questions. Ask us questions. If you want to talk about the Women's Self-Defense Program, it's starting yeah. up again in July at July 10th 9th. Planet HQ. Yep. And then July 16th in Whittier, California. We'll teach the women how to be badasses. Mr. Lee, um, for all of our podcast needs. I just go to LeeSyatt.com. L-E-E-S-Y-A-T-T. Thank you so much. Josh, thanks again for coming. We'll see you guys next week. Peace out, bitches. Bye. Deuces.